Back in the days of the Roman Empire, a seal was a mark. It was a mark that indicated that you owned something. Let's say you had a paper document. You could make a seal with melted wax. You would take the soft wax and put it on the document, and you would press your family ring or your family's crest into the soft wax and that would indent the wax with the crest or with the ring and then you would wait for the wax to dry and once the wax dried it made a seal and that seal showed that paper document as belonging to you, your family. Now that works well with paper documents but you couldn't really use a seal out of wax to say, mark a bunch of cattle as belonging to you. And so people started branding cattle with hot irons, and that brand was also a seal, a mark of ownership. This particular herd or this particular cow, this particular sheep, this particular ox belongs to me and belongs to my family. Roman soldiers were also branded. Some of you might have seen the movie Gladiator that came out 19 years ago. You might remember Russell Crowe's character Maximus, a Roman soldier. He had four letters tattooed on his arm. The movie at one time gives a close-up of, of that tattoo. The letters were S-P-Q-R, that's Latin, for Senatus Populus Romanus, which is translated the Senate and the Roman people. That was one of the main slogans of the Roman Empire throughout its history. And that tattoo with the letters of that acronym, Senatus Populus Romanus, marked him as a Roman soldier who served the people and the Senate of Rome. That tattoo was a seal. That tattoo showed as a seal that he was a soldier who belonged to Rome. If you were a slave, or if you were a prisoner, a captive, you likewise were branded for the same reasons, to show that you belonged to this person, or you belonged to this prison, or you belonged to this state. Now the reason I bring this up is because the text of our lesson is taken from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And Paul, when he wrote this passage, was writing to this kind of culture. A culture in which people are literally sealed, literally branded to show who owns them. Or to show whose loyalties they have. That's the culture he was living in when he wrote Ephesians. For those of you who have been here over the past two Sunday mornings, you've remembered that we looked at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. And we have examined the spiritual blessings that God has showered upon us, all of us who are Christians, all of us who are in Christ. We saw how in verse 3 and 4, the Father chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. We looked at verse 5 and 6. We saw how the Father in heaven already predestined or predetermined to adopt us as his children. We saw in verse 6 that we are highly favored, blessed in his sight. Last week, we looked at verses 7 through 12, and we saw how the blood of Jesus redeemed us. That word redeemed meaning that it paid the ransom to free us from the slavery and the guilt and the penalty of sin. 
We saw how we are forgiven by the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross, which we just commemorated in communion this morning. We also saw how Christ has given us the mystery of God's will in this book, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. And the reason he did it was to unite us all as God's family on earth with everyone else who is a part of his family on earth, as well as everyone who is in heaven. We also saw how we have an inheritance. The inheritance of eternal life in heaven waiting for us. We saw all of that in verses 3 through 12. And today we're going to look at verses 13 and 14 of chapter 1 of Ephesians. Let's read this passage. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Here's what Paul is basically saying in verses 13 and 14. He's saying, Christians, I want you to think back to when you obeyed the gospel. And Christians, I want you to realize something. When you obeyed the gospel... You received the seal of God in your life. And that seal is a promise. That seal, the seal of God, is basically God saying to you, you are mine. I chose you. I adopted you. You are highly favored by me. I have redeemed you. You, I have forgiven you. I want to be with you. You are mine. That's what the seal means. Let's see how by looking more closely at this passage. I want you to remember that that seal is a mark. That's what the term means in the original Greek. That's what they would associate it with in the days of the Roman Empire when Paul wrote this back in the first century. A seal is used to guarantee the legitimacy of a document. A seal is used to protect against tampering. A seal is used to mark ownership. And verse 13 says that the Holy Spirit is that seal. How? I want us to consider a few things. Please open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. This will not be on the screen. Romans chapter 8, I want you to look at verse 9. Romans 8 verse 9. Paul says to Christians, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have The Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. What are you saying, Paul? He is saying that the Holy Spirit dwelling in the Christian is evidence that the Christian is really a Christian. It's evidence that this person in whom the Spirit of God dwells truly belongs to Christ. The Holy Spirit is a seal, a mark of ownership. But that's not on. Uh, You look at verses 13 and 14 of Romans 8. He goes on to say, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. How do we as Christians put to death the deeds of the body? How do we get rid of the sin that would tamper with us, that would harm us. It is by the Holy Spirit of God, according to verses 13 and 14. Look at verse 16 of Romans 8. He says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. It says that the Holy Spirit bears witness that we are God's children. That's a guarantee. The Holy Spirit is guaranteeing that you and I are genuinely part of God's spiritual family. But let's go back to Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. 
It is that last definition of a seal that we talked about earlier this morning. The proof of ownership showing the genuine character of a document. It's that definition of a seal that Paul is really focusing on here in the Ephesians passage because in verse 14 he says that it is the Holy Spirit whom we are sealed with, notice, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Do you remember last week when we looked at verses 7 through 12 and we studied how those of us who are Christians, those of us who are in Christ, are given a wonderful inheritance, an inheritance that Peter says is kept in heaven or reserved in heaven for you. It's waiting for us in heaven. Well, guess what? The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of that inheritance. Later on in the book of Ephesians, if you skip over to chapter 4 and you look at verse 30, Paul would say that the Holy Spirit seals us for what? For the day of redemption. The day of redemption. That wonderful day when the faithful children of God will stand in front of the throne of God and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. That wonderful day when you and I will receive that glorious inheritance of eternal life in heaven. Chapter 4, verse 30 of Ephesians says that it is the Holy Spirit who seals us for that day of redemption. Seals us. It's a guarantee. He is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Now we haven't acquired possession of it yet because we are still living this life here on earth. The day of judgment has not yet come. But when that day comes, until that glorious day comes when we finally acquire the possession of our inheritance in heaven. Never forget, the Holy Spirit of God, the third member of the Godhead, is our seal, our guarantee that we belong to God. Now here's another question I have. When are we sealed with the Holy Spirit? When are we sealed with the Holy Spirit? When did it happen? Go back to verse 13. He says that it was when we had heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. It was when we believed in Jesus, the one about whom that gospel speaks. When did we receive the seal of the Holy Spirit, the guarantee of our inheritance? It was when we obeyed the gospel. What does it mean to obey the gospel? When we heard the gospel, and when after hearing it, we were convicted by it. We had faith in it. We believed in it with all of our heart. And that wholehearted faith in the gospel, it motivated us to do something. It prompted us to do something. What did it motivate us to do? To obey the commands that are found in that gospel. The command to repent of our sins. The command to be baptized into Christ. As Ephesians says, all of these spiritual blessings are for those who are in Christ. How do you get in Christ? The Bible says you are baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And when you come up out of the waters of baptism, at that point is when you become a child of God. It is at that point that He has adopted you. It's at that point that He chose you. It's at that point that you become part of His spiritual family and this glorious inheritance that the Holy Spirit guarantees has your name on it. You go in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. All of what we've been talking about today is exactly what Peter was talking about on the day of Pentecost. When he was preaching to all of those Jews who had gathered from all over the world in Jerusalem to observe that holy day of Pentecost. And he told them that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Verse 37 says that when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, 
They believed it. They heard the gospel. They believed it. They were convinced of it. They were convicted of it. That's why they were cut to the heart. And he said, and they said to him, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And notice that he didn't, he never told them to do what so many churches tell people to do to be saved today. He never did tell them, well, you obviously already believe this. That's all you have to do is believe in Christ. He didn't tell them to do that. He didn't say all you have to do is pray a prayer to Jesus and ask Jesus into your heart. That's not what he told them to do. In fact, you do research on that. The whole notion of being saved only by saying a prayer to Christ is this year, or actually, excuse me, next year, 2020, is exactly 100 years old. Didn't come up till the 1920s. That, it didn't, wasn't thought up till 100 years ago. It's a doctrine of man. It's a false teaching. It's one of Satan's ways to deceive you into thinking that you are saved when you are not saved. Here's what the Bible says. They asked him, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive what? You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 39, he says, the promise is for you, the people he's talking to on the day of Pentecost, and to your children, their descendants, and then he says, and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Thessalonians says that God calls people through the gospel. As many as who are far off, he's talking about everyone in the world. He's talking about the people in this room 2,000 years later on the other side of the planet who are called by the gospel. This promise is for you. And what is the promise? When you repent after believing in Jesus with all of your heart, and you are baptized, not only will your sins be forgiven, but you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what's Ephesians talking about? What's Ephesian, Ephesians associated? That gift of the Holy Spirit? Look up at the screen. You receive the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee, the seal, that you are saved. That your name is written in the registry of heaven. That that inheritance is yours. Paul would say in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. But then he would say in the next verse, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Peter would say in Acts 5, verse 32, that the Holy Spirit is given by God to all who obey him. He's talking about Christians. He's talking about Christians who obey the gospel. But let's move on. There's something else. If you look again at verse 14, there's something else about the Holy Spirit being our guarantee of our inheritance that I want to bring out this morning. The term guarantee in the original Greek, it was used to refer to money which was given as a pledge. Money that was basically a down payment in a purchase. And when you make a down payment, what, what are you doing? Why do they call that earnest money? It's to show that you're earnest, that you really do want to make this purchase, that you really do want to follow through on the deal that you're making about the house or the car or whatever it is that you put a down payment on. I am putting this money down as a guarantee that the full amount will be paid by me. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, this same Greek word that's translated here as guaranteed, it's translated three times in the Hebrew as a pledge. So I want you to look at it this way. God has given us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as, as a deposit of sorts. Compare it to earnest money. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee of what God has prepared for us. The blessings of the Spirit working in our lives here on earth is nothing but a foretaste of the glory in heaven that will one day be ours. 
So when you open up your Bibles and you read what the Holy Spirit does for us now in this life as Christians, for example, when you read Romans 15 verse 13 that says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Or if you read Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16, Where it says that God would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with power through His his Spirit in the inner man. Or when you read about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. When you read about all of that and more, just look at it as a sampling of what is waiting for us in heaven. Now, there are so many questions about this, though. Exactly how does the Holy Spirit work in our lives? What does it mean that the Spirit of Christ or, or the Spirit of God is in you? What, what, what does that really mean? You want to learn more about how the Holy Spirit works in your lives, Christians? You have questions about the Holy Spirit? Be here tomorrow night at 6.30. That's what this diving deep class is all about. It's about going deep into the Word of God to see exactly what the Bible actually teaches about things, including the Holy Spirit. We had a full class, five people. We filled up that conference room last week. I would love for it to be ten people so that we have to go into one of the bigger classrooms that the school uses. Come tomorrow night, 6.30 to 7.30. You'll still make it home in time for bed. If you want to learn more about how the Spirit works in your life, take advantage of this opportunity. But let me close by saying this. We have the Holy Spirit as a seal, a guarantee, a mark to show that we belong to God. How should we react to this? Look again at the last part of verse 14. He is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory, to the praise of His glory. All of these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places that are given to us in Christ that we've looked at over the past three Sundays, all of them are designed to motivate you and me to praise God to praise His glory, to praise His kindness. No wonder, you go back up to verse 3 in Ephesians 1, where he first starts this discussion. What's the very first thing that he says? He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is blessed. We are blessing Him because He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Christians, we should be thanking God and praising Him every single day for the wonderful things He does for us. And not only should we be thanking Him and praising Him, we should be thinking and focused on all the blessings He gives us spiritually, materially, physically, emotionally, mentally. We should be focused on all of that to motivate us to not only thank Him and praise Him, but also to serve Him. To serve Him with every fiber of our being. That's what Romans 12 is talking about, you know. The ver- verses 1 and 2 of Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you do what? You present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You present your bodies as a living sacrifice, that's just a fancy way of saying you dedicate your entire life to God. Every aspect of your life should be serving God. That is your reasonable service to Him. And how do we do that? Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Is that how you are living your life, Christian? Is your mind more like, is your way of thinking, your worldview, your habits, 
Are they more in line with the people in this world who are not Christians, or are they more in line with the Spirit-inspired Word of God? Are we setting our minds on the things above, or are we focused too much on the things of the earth? Can you honestly say that your entire life is a living sacrifice to God, that he rules in every single aspect of your life? Is that how we live our lives, Christian? It needs to be. It needs to be starting today. And if you are in this room and you are not a Christian, you need to become a Christian, and that needs to happen today, right now. You've heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Do you want the seal of God, which is the Holy Spirit? Do you want that guarantee that you have an inheritance in heaven? Look at the verse on the screen. You have to believe it, and you have to prove you believe in it by repenting of your sins and being baptized. And that's when you receive forgiveness and salvation. That's when you receive the seal of the Holy Spirit. That mark that shows that you belong to God, that you serve Him. That guarantee that you have an inheritance in heaven. The time to do that is right now, today. If you have that need, please come while we stand and sing.